every single thing that I have gotten that has been good for my career has been because of personal relationships or um, having a, a relationship with somebody that went out of their way to do something for me simply because it was like a nice thing to do. I'm Sharla Larston. I've been a TV writer for almost a decade, but it wasn't that long ago that quitting my day job and moving to Hollywood was nothing but a pipe dream. After lots of failures, many mistakes, and many lessons learned, I've now written for seven TV shows, two features, and sold three TV pilots. I've done all this through imposter syndrome, burnout, and with zero roadmap. On the Working Writer Podcast, I pull back the curtain on breaking in and teach screenwriters and creatives how to thrive both personally and professionally. Without further ado, let's get to work. Welcome to another episode of the Working Writer Podcast. Thanks, guys, for joining me once again. If you're a regular listener of this podcast, then you know it's been a while since I've dropped an episode. And I'm so excited to come back with the illustrious Lauren Ashley Smith. Lauren has written for The Rundown with Robin Thede. She was also a head writer on A Black Lady Sketch Show. It's where I met Lauren on the set of A Black Lady Sketch Show. I got to do Punch Up on that show, which was such an excellent, exciting, amazing amazing experience. I loved every moment of it. It was so exhilarating and exciting and difficult and challenging and cool because it was HBO and because it was a Black Lady Sketch Show. Um, And Lauren was an absolute dream to work with. And it was so cool getting to know her through this interview and like hearing a little bit more about her background. What I've learned basically is that Lauren is a career TV writer producer. She's been in TV since the very beginning of her career. And it has been a straight trajectory for her and she's just continued to kill it in the industry. And I think there's lots to learn from this episode and to enjoy. So without any further ado, please take a listen to this episode with Lauren Ashley Smith. Before we jump into the episode, I wanted to let you know about my new Zero to Pilot guide. If you're struggling to finish your pilot and just sit down and write is advice that has never worked for you, then this guide will. In it, I walk you through how to break down your pilot project and finish it in eight weeks or less. Download the free guide now at the link in the description and finally finish your pilot. Lauren Ashley Smith, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. It's so good to have you. I feel like I didn't get to talk to you at all when I was on the Black Lady set. And I'm just like, I was just so impressed with you the entire time. I was obsessed. Oh my God. Thank you. I was obsessed. I know because it was COVID time. So it was like six feet, 20 feet. It was. It was crazy times. Um, (laughs) Also, I have to say that Black Lady was like one of the most well organized. You know, obviously I wasn't in the actual writer's room. I was on set, but it was just so well organized. You guys use Slack. (laughs) You guys, it was just like such a millennial set, but it was like obviously women are running it because it's like really organized. I was like super impressed. Honestly, that's what I was going to say. I was like, all credit goes to the fact that like every department head was a woman and it just worked. It showed. Um, And I didn't even know that. And I just knew that the vibes were different. I was just like, this just just runs like a well-oiled machine. This is unbelievable. And honestly, I would say the most of the credit goes to the fact that the line producer UPM was a woman and she is a badass at her job. That is honestly where all the credit goes. Who is it? Who is, what's her name? Linda Morell, the best. Okay. What has she worked on? Is she like, uh, she worked on key and peel for a long time. Um, so like she knows sketch. Yeah. Probably the best person you could have gotten for that job. Wow. Yeah. Wonderful. God damn. All right. Well, I ha- I feel like I have a lot of questions and a lot of them are just, who are you? Um, and where <laughs> do you come from? And what are you doing here? <laughs> so those are my questions. <laughs> okay, great. Amazing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, well, yeah. The where do you come is, from? I have yeah. no idea. No. Uh- oh, great. Well, (laughs) that's the episode. Uh, Bye. Bye. (laughs) We're all losing it. I've been talking to only 
writers and comedians and everyone's losing their shit it's hilarious uh but we're all in it together so we are we are okay what was the first question well where where were you from lauren ashley smith i don't know that much about you because i didn't get a chance to like chit chat because we were so busy on set you know so Um, where are you from from, how did you get to la and how did you make it to black lady sketch show just very quickly okay (laughs) i'm just kidding you can take the whole episode to talk about it (laughs) this is starting great (laughs) wonderful Mm -hmm. Um, I'm from St. Louis, Missouri, the Midwest, and I um, went to college in Pennsylvania to a small school called Dickinson College. And in my junior year, I um, like was at this like luncheon or whatever for people who had gotten like scholarships. And I ended up sitting next to this amazing woman who was a trustee of my college at the time who we had like traveled to the same place. And so she like was really nice to me. And she was like, well, what do you want to do? And I was like, I want to work in TV. I want to live in New York. And she said, well, I have a friend that works at SNL and I have a friend that works at VH1. I can get you an interview for an internship. So um, that was very generous of her. I interned at VH1 for the summer before I graduated from college. And then I got a job in the same department, like right before I graduated. So I had a job waiting for me. Um, What was the job? It was the production assistant in VH1 News and it was VH1 News and Red Carpet Department. So like I did a lot of like um, interviewing musicians, going to South by Southwest, Fashion Week, Red Carpets, transcribing, bringing tapes from one place to another, Um, grunt work, but also really glamorous stuff like going to Fashion Week, just like very um, breakneck speed work. And then I worked my way up at VH1 while I was doing improv and sketch like classes and performing on the side. And then I mostly did magnet theater, some UCB, but mostly like my training ground was the magnet um, and story pirates, which I I would credit as as important as the magnet, to be honest. Um, And then so I worked my way up to being a producer on the reboot of Best Week Ever and I ended up becoming a writer the next season. And then I got my WGA <laughs> card. I started writing. Um, I was working on a bunch of different like late night shows and like just a bunch of different stuff. And then one of my last jobs in New York, my last job in New York was on the rundown with Robin Thede. And I started as a staff writer on that show. And then halfway through the season, I became the head writer. And I was like, oh my God, this is... <laughs> insane oh my gosh um but then the show was really great it was amazing but it got canceled and after it was over robin said i have this idea for a sketch show would you be interested in doing it and i was like yeah absolutely and she was like i'm moving back to la i was like pardon um and so i came to la for what i thought was just going to be a couple of months to do the sketch show and then things snowballed and now i've been here since 2019 oh my god Wow, you have had no breaks and you've also had no pivot. You knew what you wanted to do from college. You just happened to be talking to the right person. You just happened to land at the right place. Um, Not normal. (laughs) Not normal. But what I will say is because I got... um, And I would say, blessedly, I got really settled at VH1 where that was not an overnight thing. Like I worked at VH1 from 2006 to 2013, and I didn't even know anything about like getting a writer's PA job or being a writer's assistant. I knew I wanted to work on a show like The Daily Show, The Nightly Show, um, The Tonight Show, but I didn't really see a path towards it. But I knew I was like, okay, I know I'm working in television. I'm making my money working in television. This is seems like a good plan. And I, in doing that, I learned so much about producing and being on set and working with comedians. Like when I worked at Best Week Ever, that's where I met Michelle Buteau, Phoebe Robinson, um, so many incredible comedians that I still admire and that are so um, good at what they do and have such a specific, unique voice. And I wouldn't have had those experiences if I had just been like kind of blown off my VH1 job as like this isn't exactly what I want to be doing because it wasn't exactly what I wanted to be doing but it put me in the position to eventually do that and now that I'm in a position where like when I get a writing job it's also a producing job I'm very grateful to have had that opportunity absolutely and it's something that I hear so often is that the people who are like in those writer adjacent jobs they feel like it's so hard to make the leap 
even though in your mind, it's like, you're right there, you're so close. <laughs> and then, but still yeah. it feels like this ocean between what, where you are and where you want to be. Um, like, I feel like I kind of missed that, you know, it, connection in your, what seems like a super fast career so far. Uh, basically it's just that you were working on Robin, you were working on uh, Robin Thede's show and then you became a writer on that show. But how did you start on that show? Okay, it's really one of the most serendipitous things that has ever happened to me in my life. And I would say a lot it's of serendipitous second. things have uh, happened. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, lady, that lady randomly talking to you and getting you a freaking uh, interview at VH1 is pretty serendipitous. But yes, go it ahead. is. This is crazier. <laughs> yes. How? So I okay. was okay. I was working as a producer on Watch What Happens Live with Andy Cohen, which I loved. I loved that job. My sister mm -hmm. worked there; like she sat in the cubicle across from me. Um, it was like a a weird schedule where we were live at 11 p.m., but like it was the most positive, amazing work environment, and it was fulfilling. It was fun, and I never wanted to leave. But I always knew I wanted to write on like the Daily Show, the Nightly Show. And then when the Nightly Show got canceled, I was like, God, I missed my chance. I really wanted to write on the Nightly Show. And I really admired Robin because she was the first black woman to be the head writer of a late night show. She was the head writer of the Nightly Show with Larry Wilmore. And then I saw that she got she was getting a late night show. And I was like, I would love to work on that show. But I don't have an agent. I don't have a manager. And nobody over there, by over there, I mean Comedy Central in the Larry Wilmore, Robin Thede stand up circuit they don't know who i am there's no so i didn't even i put it off my radar a friend of mine her husband is also a comedy writer and improviser and they're white and he somehow got forwarded the packet for robin's show and he said i will not be submitting for this but you know who should lauren so he forwarded it to his wife who forwarded it to me it was due in two days the packet so i'd missed like the first three or four days of it being due and i was working at watch what happens live and on Watch What Happens Live, the show was live on Sunday. So my work schedule was Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. I got the packet on Saturday afternoon and it was due on Monday. And so I was like, I don't have any time to, to work on this. So I like did what I could and it was due on Monday at 5 p.m. And Watch What Happens Live, pretty much the day starts like the heavy time is 5 p.m. because it's an 11 p.m. show. So I literally disappeared from my desk to finish the packet <laughs> because, because I like went and hid where like in the building where like nobody went because on my way to work, I was done with my packet on Monday. I had like hustled, figured it out. I was done with my packet on Monday. It was like three o'clock in the car and I was taking a taxi from my house, my apartment to the office. And I got a better idea for my sketch that I had written for the, the packet. And I was like, damn it. I was like, this sketch is better. I don't have the time to write it, but I will feel really bad and regret it if I send a sketch that I know is second best to the one I know I can write. So at three o'clock when I got there, I disappeared from my desk. I wrote the sketch really fast, sent it at five o'clock on the dot. And I submitted only because I was like, I just want them to have my email for when they ask for submissions the next time. I'm not getting it. I know I'm not getting it. I got an interview and I was like, well, okay. I went to the interview and they were so complimentary. Robin and I really immediately hit it off. And like, she was someone who was like, I was like, so, um, not obsessed, but like I, she was like my North star person. And for mm -hmm. us to have an immediate comedy connection, the first time that we met, when I left the interview, I was like, I still don't think I'm getting the job, but I do think they will call me the next time they need somebody. Maybe. Okay. Then I got the job and I was like, oh my good God. And then the thing that got me the job is the sketch that I wrote. And that sketch was the first thing that we filmed for that, for that show. Get out. Wait, what's yes. the sketch? It was called The Handmaid's Tale. It was like a Handmaid's Tale parody, but instead of uh, all the horrible things that happened in The Handmaid's Tale, it was about white women touching black women's hair. And mm -hmm. it ended up being like, on all these like top 10 lists of the year of like best late night moments and stuff like wow. that sketch that I had the idea for in the car and was mad. I was like, I don't want to write, I don't want to write it, but that got me the job. And wow. that, that moment of being like, it might not be perfect, but I know this idea is better and going for it is what landed me in all the things that I, you know, have going on right now. That's crazy, Lauren. You know why? Because 
I think so much of our job is like knowing when to trust your gut and your intuition and like having a sense of taste, <laughs> like having a sense mm-hmm. of, I know what's better. I know what's funnier and like really trusting that. So you literally could have not gotten that job. And also it's to me unheard of to have a sketch shot from a packet submission <laughs> like never that never happened <laughs> never and i when i tell you it was pretty yeah. much verbatim from the packet that's crazy that's crazy and you wrote it at three o'clock when you got to work yes hiding. i did <laughs> Yes, I did. You know what? Sometimes pressure is good. Sometimes pressure is good. Um, so you have, you, you've basically just been working in TV your entire career, which is amazing. Yes. You know, that's pretty cool. What's the experience been like? Um, it's been really great. And it's been especially rewarding and funny and fun because like I have two younger sisters. And um, when I moved to New York, what, the one that was like, is right after me. She went to college in New York. So she like came the same year that I did. And then my little sister came a couple years after that and they both went into television. So like my middle sister worked at Sesame street for a long time. And my little sister, my youngest sister is also a TV writer and we've worked together on some stuff. How Um, cute. (laughs) Yeah. And it's like super fun that I'm like, Oh my gosh, like how did this end up happening? Like we all kind of have the same job. Um, and it's because That's of that lady crazy. at the luncheon. I honestly think like, I don't know if maybe I would have decided to move to Philly after college and like do whatever else. And maybe the three of us would live in Philly and be doing whatever else. That is so cute. Wow. Okay. Um, <laughs> um now I'm like, <laughs> you have, you haven't had any like huge detours, so I guess I'm just like, what are you working on now? Um, okay, I've had plenty of detours. Don't you worry. Okay. All um, right. but but you know, what I will say is that all of my detours were like within the confines of VH1. So like when I worked mm-hmm. at VH1, I worked in several different departments and had several different types of jobs. And even at one point. One of the like, and it's like so (laughs) minimal to me as like someone who's much older now and has like actual problems. But like one of my jobs, I loved working on Best Week Ever and because I, that was a show that like I watched when I was younger. And so when it was rebooted, I was like, I love the show so much. That show, my um, boss on that show basically like made me quit my improv team, which was like the only thing that was like making me feel like creatively fulfilled. It was like the th- I was like on a house team. I it was like something that I worked really hard to get. And it was like either my job that pays me in comedy television. And at that point, I was not yet a writer. I was a producer or the thing that makes me feel like a human being. And I had to quit. And I was devastated. I was like, I don't want to work somewhere where they are making me make this choice. I don't know who I am if I'm not performing six nights a week, you know, or if I'm not on a house team. It's like, I took all these classes. I did all these things. Like, this is who I am. I'm an improviser. And if I quit improv to do my TV job, what is that going to, like, how is that going to affect? I'm I'm never going to write on SNL. I'm never going to do all those things. And like, I sure I have not written on SNL, but I got a black lady sketch show. And so like, that was a moment that was like, really, it sounds so silly, but it was like, so rough for me to have to make that, have that decision made for me and be like, well, I can't quit my job. Like I I have to pay my rent. Like I'm not independently wealthy. I need (laughs) income. Um, and I've put in all this work this, this far. And so that I would say is like, one of the biggest detours that I had in that like trajectory. That was like the darkest moment right before things got way better. Why did they make you quit, (laughs) quit improv? And why did they have a say? Because, um, it was, if I remember correctly, I think the team that I was on was on Wednesday nights or Thursday nights and best week ever was a weekly show. And Wednesday was our late night. And as a producer, I was supposed to like be in the edit until like nine or 10 PM or something. And what I wanted to do was like leave, do my show at seven, only stay for my half hour set and be back by eight. And it was not that far. And they were like, no. That's not going to work. Cause if we let you do that, then everybody else will have to do that. I'm like, well, nobody else here does improv. This is not, a, this is not going to be a, an improv uh, epidemic, but 
I understand, you know, now where they were coming from, but I just was like, my all of my years at VH1 up until that point, I was able to make it work. And for them to just not like, I think right. they just kind of had like a little bit of a chip on their shoulder about it. And they didn't like that I was able to make it work. So they took the opportunity away. Wow. Pretty mean and dark. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I've had, you know, I think a lot of us have had moments where people have crushed our spirit. But what I think is funny about that is that, you know, there's so many jokes about improv. Like, I feel like improv is always like the butt of the joke, <laughs> you know, like, oh, I'm going to go to like my cousin's improv show or something like that. But I'm just like, people put blood into years yes. and sweat and years of equity and not to mention money into classes and just like sacrifice to do improv, you know? So I'm just like, yes. I think it should, it should get a little bit more respect. And I actually think that it has trained so many comedians that you watch on TV every single day. So I'm just like, people make fun of it, but you know? <laughs> yeah. I'm like, not, not too much. I'm a friend improv. I mean, I make fun yeah. of it too, but it also is what made, <laughs> made me a good TV writer. I, I, I have credit improv for making me a, a better stand up, a better TV writer, all, all across the board. So now I'm really interested to know about like, since, uh, uh, Robin's show is your first writer's room. You went from your first writer's room to head writer in one. Uh, that was my show. second writer's room. I was oh, on okay. um, best. I was a writer on best week ever on the reboot. Oh, okay. Okay. Before. My bad. My After bad. I was a producer, I was a writer on that. And then I wrote on some other things that were like, usually it would be like just me. So like, the writer's room was me. Um, but yeah, it was kind of like, that was my first like straight up where it's like, we're doing desk pieces. We're doing monologues. We're doing yeah. and sketch and topical news things. Like best week ever was more reacting to pop culture. It wasn't mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm. and every once in a while, if there was like a really wacky, like press conference or something from like CNN or whatever, or C-SPAN, we would cover that. But generally it was like what happened in the world of pop culture. Um, so yeah, I mean, for sure the, the rundown was like my first, I would say most typical, like for sure. seven or eight people room. meeting every mm -hmm. morning. Here's what happened in the news, writing for one host type thing for sure. For sure. So then what was that like to go from that to being the head writer? Um, it was not as abrupt of a transition as it sounds because the room was so collaborative and to begin with and because when I started it became very like clear to me and to Robin and to um that like I understood her voice and so like I would there would be times where like we would just like you know I would write something with another person or another person, like everybody was working together so much that it just felt like an extension of that where I was working together on everything. You know what I'm saying? As opposed to, it's like we were all working together. So I was like, it didn't really change that much. If that yeah, makes sense. I, totally I wasn't working by myself. And then all of a sudden the head writer, we were working so collaboratively that it just was like, Oh, like now, like I'm working with everybody every day. That makes, makes sense. Right, right, right. Um, I just, but even for me, I just remember like going from, you know, like mid-level writer to like supervising producer. <laughs> I was like all jittery. <laughs> I was all like, oh God, you know, they're like really looking at me. <laughs> right? Yes. But you know, I, I, I had to chill because it was like, I do know, you know, it's like, I do know it's, it's just in yes. my head of, of the title change. Somehow the title change stressed me out, but it was fine, for sure. Truly. And you know what I will say to that point? Um, I definitely had a moment. It was like in my first week as the head writer. And I was like in a you know big morning meeting. And I thought to myself, I said, I can never zone out for even one second ever yeah. again. <laughs> not, not just for a half a second. And I'm not a zone out person. But I was like, that has been taken off the table because when you're not the head writer, you can just take 30 seconds to have inside thoughts to be like, mm, what yep. am I going to have for lunch today? You don't have to, if someone else is pitching, you can look down at your notes and be like, okay, like that what actually is, you know, what am I pitching? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, that, the day that I realized that that time had passed, I said, oh girl, what you got yourself into? We're in a new world now. <laughs> yes. 
yes. now we're in a new world okay um wonderful um what have you noticed about like what makes a show run well and what makes a room one run well from your from some all the experiences that you've had i would say that the number one thing is decisiveness i will always appreciate and i have learned and work toward being super decisive because if the person that is at the top, I've seen people who are really good at it. They know that if they waffle in their decision, that holds up everybody else. That's an hour later of an evening for a department. If you can't decide if you want the curtains to be pink or orange and decisiveness is like so crucial. And that's why you have shows like a black lady sketch show that ran so well because the person at the top was very decisive and knew the, um, like how the domino effect of all of the yeses and nos that you give throughout the day. Um, and then I would say outside of that, it's like making people feel, um, I would say my philosophy as a head writer is always to like, I always want everyone in the room to be know like, when are the breaks? When are we getting lunch? What are we doing today? What are we doing this afternoon? Because if you, at, in my position, when I've been not the head writer and I'm sitting there being like, is now the right time to pitch my idea for sketches? <laughs> or are we taking, are we doing desk bits now? Like you don't want to shoot your shot in the wrong moment or you, you want to make sure that it's a warm room for what you're about to present. And the second that you're burdened with, trying to figure out and orient yourself the day that's 20%, 30%, 40% off of your ability to just be freed up to do your job and be creative and pitch out ideas. So when I'm in charge, I like to make sure that people know exactly what's going on so that they're not guessing and then spending their mental energy guessing rather than like doing the thing that we all like love to do, which is, you know, come up with funny stuff. 100%. I've always felt like there because I've been in so many rooms that don't do that uh even though I have been in wonderful rooms that do do that thank god (laughs) but so many rooms that don't do that that it made me feel like there just needs to be like some sort of standardized room structure because I'm just like it can't be like this like for every room I go to to be so vastly different but still yet disorganized (laughs) yet somehow you know we don't know what we're doing you know (laughs) yes it's it's funny because it's like obviously like surgery is like a very important thing with like life and death consequences but it's not like you go to one hospital and like the way that we start surgery is like we we do it this way and then you go to another hospital and they're like yeah well we actually just cut the person open you know at this point it's like yeah. no there's a there's a run of show a, okay yeah there's a set of <laughs> expectations of can we at least have that maybe so we know like yeah it's like going to a play it's like you know that either it's going to be 90 minutes or less and it's not going to have an intermission or if it's longer than that there will be a 15 minute minute intermission it doesn't determine what's going to happen in the two or three acts they tell you yes yeah even at the play they will tell you what to expect Mm -hmm. yes and and the reason why i'm like because if you're spending so much money you're spending millions of dollars on each of these things shouldn't there be some sort of structure so that at the very least there's some template for how the day is going to go. But hey, I don't make the rules. I don't make the rules. In television, which is why I really appreciated that you guys had some. <laughs> <laughs> I'm coming for everyone today. I don't know what's going on with me. I think I know, but <laughs> I'm coming for everyone. Um, uh, so let's take a quick break. And when we come back, let's talk about what you're working on now. Okay, great. If you have a pilot sitting around and it's half done, the Zero to Pilot Guide will walk you through how to break down the project and get it done in eight weeks or less. Download your free Zero to Pilot Guide at the link in the description. And we're back. So LAS, Lauren Ashley Smith, um, what are you working on right now? Um, I am in an overall deal at CBS Studios. So my job right now is to create and come up with half hour comedy. So I have a couple things that I'm like about to take out. Um, and then I, every once in a blue moon, will do like a feature on the side um, outside of that. And then I also have a daily radio show with my sisters um, where we talk about pop culture and we're working on a book. So that I would say is the, 
the five, how many was that? Four or five jobs that I, yeah. I currently keep at the moment. I love that you're doing so many things with your sisters. That is so cute. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I'm so jelly. And I saw the announcement when you got that overall deal with CBS. I was so excited because, uh, yay, you know, um, I think you're awesome. And that's such a cool thing to do. Um, what has the experience, I feel like an overall deal is kind of like the, you know, <laughs> it's kind of like the gold standard for a lot of us. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like what we hope to achieve at some point. How has, how did that experience come about and what has it been like? Well, I'm going to tell you because, like I said, I lived in New York and worked in New York, in, which is like when I came to L.A., it became very cl clear to me that L.A. is where the business is and New York is like the satellite office. Um, so when I got to L.A., despite having a lot of experience, I learned a lot of things about how the business works and how shows work and just, just studio systems and all that stuff that I just did not know in New York. All that to say, I did not know what an overall deal was until it was presented to me. Oh, wow. <laughs> not until it was presented to you. I didn't know. I didn't know those existed. I mean, I think in the back of my mind, I was like, I would like know when like, oh, like, but like huge celebrities where it's like, you know, freaking J.J. Abrams signs like a a yeah. trillion dollar mm -hmm. deal with whatever. But I did. That was the extent of it. Mm -hmm. I did not know the ins and outs of it for real. So here's what happened. I worked on a piece of development with CBS studios. I had a great experience. Um, we sold the show. The show didn't go forward, which was really a bummer, but keeping with my personal philosophy that I always tell people is like, do the, and this is what I did at VH1, like do the job you were hired to do, do that well first. And maybe you like, don't want to be a writer's assistant and you want to be a writer, that's fine. But if they hired you to be a writer's assistant, do be the writer's assistant, be amazing at it. I was hired to do this development, which I loved. I learned so much. I was really proud of the script. It was such a great collaborative working relationship. And I believe, I don't know for sure, but I believe um, that because I did the job that I was hired to do and we had a great working relationship, they were like, we would like to do this some more. And that is how the deal came about. It was not this, you know, like overwrought, hard, difficult thing because my mindset is like, I'm always like, I want to do the job that's in front of me and I want to do it to the best of my ability. And what happens next is completely out of my control. What I can control is the work that I do and the person that I am and how I treat people in this moment. And that paid off in that, in that instance and I continue to have an amazing relationship with them because we really did hit it off. And I just love being there so much. That's awesome. I love that. Um, you mentioned learning certain things when you moved from New York to LA. Uh, what did you learn? <laughs> oh my gosh, so much. Um, you know, because most of the stuff I had done in New York was I'd done, done some shows like where I was like on location or whatever, but I'd never really been on a lot, save for like, coming to LA for general meetings or, or something. I'd never been on a sound stage. I'd been in tons of studios and, you know, the New York version of sound stages, but I had not been like to like Disney ranch where it's like, you see like a cabin and a mansion and a cul-de-sac and a, a fake pond and all those things. Like it didn't, I'd never worked with stunts before. I had never done some of the more large scale things that you just don't have the ability to do with like a studio late night show. Um, I learned a lot about like, uh, like crews and like every person's, you know, job on the crew, um, and on set and off and stuff like that. So I just like really worked really hard to immerse myself and be knowledgeable so that I could like do my job to the best of my ability anytime, you know, that I've gotten, they've presented themselves to me, but yeah, it was mostly about like the size and scale of things here that just, you don't really, unless you work on like SVU or something, you don't get the opportunity to do in New York. Damn. Really cool. And what have you learned, I guess, since developing or doing an overall deal? Um, I would say what I learned, uh, from developing is, that you have to be like specificity and point of view always win. You cannot guess at what people want to buy or what they might have an appetite for. Um, 
because you could likely be wrong because you ultimately don't know what connects with people is like feeling like there's a strong point of view, an interesting story, a world that feels like it's been put together and come out of you as opposed to like, um, paint by numbers. Like I know this, this network is looking for, um, a show about this thing. And I know that this network is looking for this person. So let me just like try to Lego them together and present them what they want. That is not ever a winning formula. And anytime I've ever had success is when I was like, what is funny to me? What is resonant to me? What does my world look like? And how do I use that to tell like universal truths and stories that are funny to everybody? And that is when I've had success. Not when I've tried to be like, try to wedge something into what I think people want from me. So I guess, I mean, you come from uh, a small college, a small town, and now you live in, you've lived in places like New York and LA. And I feel like every time, uh, like my family lives in Taunton, Massachusetts, every time I go back, it always feels so, it feels somehow smaller, (laughs) you know, like, (laughs) you know, it feels somehow smaller every single time I go back. And people always make me feel like, oh my God, well, you moved to, you know, New York or LA or whatever. And to me, of course, New York and LA are very normal uh, places. So how does it, how do you get treated when you go home and how has it felt to be somebody who came from a small place and goes, lives in these big cities? You know, okay. So I, I love St. Louis and St. Louis is a really diverse city, but it's very segregated in a lot of ways. And so coming from living in New York for a long time and LA similar, but a little bit less. So like in New York city, because of the subway and the way that the city is set up, you find yourself in proximity with people who are different from you just by like going to take the trash out of your apartment or going to the subway or, um, the bodega, whatever, like you're going to run into somebody who like speaks a different language from you, has a different religion from you, looks different from you, different job, just because there's so much diversity and, that affects how you, your level of comfort around people that are different from you. And what I do notice when I go to St. Louis is that uh, certain places I might go, I'll be like, oh, wow, this person doesn't encounter a lot of people that look like me to the point that they're desensitized because I can kind of see them staring at me. Like, not like full boring a hole in me, but kind of a little bit. And it's not that they like don't like me or that they have negative feelings towards me. It's just that they don't encounter either black people or black, you know, it, it's just different. Whereas like New York or LA, you don't have, there's not enough space and there's not enough homogeneity for that to be someone's lived experience for the most part. Wow. For some reason, I, uh, I'm like, could we even consider St. Louis a small town? Is it, it's no, I would say it's a mid-sized it's a city. city. Yeah. Yeah. And yet but still, it's, just, it's still like that. Yeah. And it well, I would say probably also because like, it doesn't like New York, you have like the subway. LA doesn't have a ton of great public transportation, but St. Louis, it's like, it's like a place where it's like you live where you live and you might get in your car and go to a different area, but it's just more like stationary isolated. Whereas people in LA are like, Oh, I'm on on the East side this day, the West side this day. Like it's just a little bit more interspersed. Right. 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 Yeah. What has, have you ever thought like, Hmm, I wish I could live in New York again. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) What, what has your experience been in LA? Um, I love LA. I love the weather. I love the space. I love, um, the people honestly, which I think a lot of people are like, Oh my God, like LA is so fake or whatever. I've not found that to be true. What I don't like about LA is that everyone is in the same business. Um, when I lived in New York, like my friends that I, you know, still have there, it's like, they are entrepreneurs, they're teachers, they're cancer researchers, they're, um, artists like visual artists they're dance teachers they're all these things and they're actors and they're writers and all these things here it's like everyone here is an actor editor director writer and that's it and producer um and so like even the overheard conversations are different like you'll be like in cvs and someone's like yeah well it's a, it's a three picture deal and blah blah, blah. it's like that doesn't happen in New York. <laughs> <laughs> so i i that's true I miss New York being more like just less a one, um, a one subject town than LA is. 
Um, and I also, I'm not a driver, so I miss feeling like completely autonomous and like independent the way that I do in New York. I know I can get anywhere of my own volition with my Metro card or my phone or whatever. Like I'm good. I miss that sense of independence. Um, but overall I really deeply enjoy LA, but like if somebody was like tonight in five minutes, will you move back to New York? I'd be like, let's go. Um, I've also been wondering like, would I ever move back to New York? <laughs> What's the answer? I don't know. So Vancouver is quite livable. You know, the level right. of livability here is really high. It's not nearly as social and as uh. bustling and as alive, <laughs> I would say. It's very sleepy and quiet and slow, uh, which is oh, which is great in its in at times. I really love that and like especially like if I'm in LA for a while and I come back to Vancouver, it feels like a nice like change of pace. Mm -hmm. uh, and I also think the summer here is like a secret hotspot. Like I actually think it's like the most beautiful place to be in the summertime. Love Any that. other time of the year, I don't want to be here. <laughs> <laughs> Any other time of the year, I'm just like, I could go to New York right now and just chill for a little bit. Uh, Are just because there... it's like rainy. Yeah. It's, yeah okay. You know, fair. Yeah. Are Dark. there black people in Vancouver? No, no. <laughs> okay. I was gonna say not enough, but I would I would almost say no. You know what I mean? Like I <laughs> literally joined like a ladies, you know, like meetup in Vancouver, like for friendship, and one like seventy five white people <laughs> replied, and one black person replied, and I was like, <laughs> I was oh like, my god, <laughs> let's meet up. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the situation. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> yeah, that's the situation. But aside from that, you know what I mean? I definitely think that like diversity makes the experience so different, you know, like living in a place that's super diverse because I, I really feel like if this place was like even 10% more diverse, it would be a completely different city because definitely. it would just be more bustling somehow, you know? It's just, yeah, but otherwise it's super livable. Like there's trains and there's, you know, bike lanes and there's, you know, parks everywhere. It's like really beautiful. Let me ask People you are this. are pretty friendly. Yeah. Okay, good. If you were to on, let's, okay, let's say it's a Tuesday. You want to go get dinner and you decide you're going to go to dinner at like nine o'clock. Is there any place open for you to get dinner? <laughs> There are a f there are some Indian places that literally never close. Apparently, you know what I mean. I mean, okay. they're like open until like three o'clock in the morning, but those are the only places. Wow, like, okay. there have been a lot of times when we've wanted to go out to dinner, and the place literally closes at nine thirty. Like, we can't, you know, we can't go, <laughs> or like wow. they won't seat us because they're closing in fifteen minutes or something like that. So that is there, you know, especially okay. when you come from a place like New York and LA and you're used to just going out at nine or 10 o'clock at night, that it has been a real shift, but you know, um, we are permanent residents now and we're going to be citizens, I think by the end of next year. Wow. So the plan, so the plan for now, yeah, my husband's job brought us here. So the plan for now is just to stay until we're citizens uh, because it's residence based. It's like based off how long you're literally here. Really? So physically, yes. <laughs> so we're can you leave? Like, can you just... like go on a trip or absolutely. like, you no, know, it's like, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Like I was in LA for months and months working, okay, but okay. you know, but then that counts against my I citizenship. Like I have to like literally keep track of when I'm here and when I leave, especially for long periods of time, because it determines when I can become a citizen. So anyway, uh, I think after that, we might probably revisit and probably <laughs> probably move somewhere a little bit more bustling. But yeah. I don't I don't have any complaints. I can always complain, but you know, no no legitimate complaints. You know, nothing legit. <laughs> yeah, I actually yeah. when people are when people are like, "How are you?" and people say I can't complain, I always say I I could complain and I can, but yeah. I won't. <laughs> I could come up with a, a complaint like this, but you know what? I can always complain. Myself. Yeah. Always. Yeah. I always feel bad for people who feel bad for complaining. I'm like, why? <laughs> no. 
it is there for you yeah that's what we do we complain okay oh my god so las um what have you learned from all of this (laughs) like all of this trajectory where you are now i also think that your experience i genuinely think your sister's being in proximity to you at different points in your career i think that is a real bomb to the experience um because i think that one of the things i remember when i first moved to la i was so like lonely for family like i definitely had a lot of friends around and that was great but i just was like it just that thing of that one subject town thing of like everyone does the same thing everyone's always talking about the same thing Mm -hmm. it just felt like I was just so I never got a break (laughs) from it (laughs) because I didn't have any like family around or friends that were not in that industry so I really feel like this was such a huge blessing to you that's my view (laughs) I I agree with that I agree with that and I also want to point out another key piece of context which is that i met my wife when i was 24 oh shit yeah 24 so, is very young yes so i've had someone that and we moved in together when i was like 25 and i'm much older than that now so like at every point and station in all of the like ups and downs of like working in television working in entertainment not like being freelance all this stuff I had a very stable like home situation that included my sisters and my partner. That's really nice. Yeah. That yeah. is a huge help. That's a huge bomb. Yeah. Because it so, like yes. made me think like, Oh, like as much as I want to succeed in TV and as much as like I'm on the ride and like have high highs and low lows, it's not entirely like who it's not all of who I am. It's not the only thing I have going like in life, you know? And it's like, I am a big sister, you know, that's my main job. Honestly, that's the thing that I care the most about. So like that helps keep some of the other stuff in perspective, at least sometimes. I love that. What have you learned from all of this, this whole journey so far of life of television I have learned, and it sounds like so corny and like easier said than done, but I truly mean this. I I truly mean this. Treating people when you meet them, whatever the context or the circumstance, like having a real human connection with somebody or and treating them as a person and treating everybody with the respect that they deserve for being a human being on this planet with you is the thing, every single thing that I have gotten that has been good for my career has been because of personal relationships or, um, having a a relationship with somebody that went out of their way to do something for me simply because it was like a nice thing to do. It wasn't like, um, about like having the best, like credits or the best representatives or whatever. And I would say that for my own part, I've, always tried to be as human and generous and like present with people as I possibly can be. And I firmly believe that like the relationships that I've built with people are what that's when you can like call on a friend and be like, can you read this? Like, or whatever. Or, you know, when someone's like, Hey, everybody on my, you know, the lineup for the stand-up show or a comedy show that I have dropped out. Can you come sit in? It's like, I would love to come sit in, not because of what it's going to do for my career, but because like, I love you as a friend and I want to see you. I want to hang out with you and let's go have some ha together. Like I truly believe in like just doing the fun, exciting, honest human being thing. And everything else is going to kind of come as a result of that. Absolutely. Um, Lauren Ashley Smith an absolute sage of wisdom. <laughs> I am as crazy as a bed bug. And that is the truth. I think one time I saw on Instagram, you got pigs or something for your birthday. Mm-hmm. I was like, I don't know this girl. Yes. I don't know anything. Yeah. Yes. I had a pig Wonderful. party in my New York apartment. That was yeah. one of my last yeah. farewells to my, my New York life. Well, what a farewell. What a farewell. Yes. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Oh my gosh, thanks for having me. That's all I got for you guys today. I hope you enjoyed the episode. 
Until next time, get out there, get to work.